good afternoon, Robert Scribbler. It is August 21st, 2018. Thank you for joining me for another climate change and clean energy video blog. Now for this segment, I'm gonna provide an update on a tropical cyclone that we talked about yesterday, and that would be Hurricane Lane, which has now reached a category four status. And I'm also gonna provide a general update of relevant news regarding the northeastern Pacific, which has just set a, a new record uh, according to one of our top hurricane experts. So, but before I, I get into that, I want to just dig into this update on Lane. So presently, Lane is located just to the south and east of the Big Island of Hawaii, and it is tracking to the north and west. According to the National Hurricane Center, the storm presently features maximum sustained winds of 150 miles an hour, which is just shy of Category 5 status. It's drifting to the west at around 12 miles per hour, but is expected to make a turn toward the north and west as it progresses later on today and into tomorrow and Thursday. The storm presently is predicted to come very close to the Hawaiian island chain as a hurricane. And some of the models that I've seen show some pretty strong interaction between the circulation of the storm and the big island of Hawaii producing strong rainfall events. And looking at this map, we can see that the circulation of tropical storm force winds, if it maintains current size, would, would brush over the big island and some of the islands further down the chain. With the storm coming very close to Kauai by late, um, by early Saturday. So, so this is a present track according to the projected track according to National Hurricane Center with the National Hurricane Center giving us an intensity of a, a maximum sustained wind intensity of 150 miles an hour, which is a, is a very strong storm. Now, Hurricane Lane is just one of many storms that we have seen in the Northeastern Pacific from August 1st to today. And according to Philip Klotzbach, the present accumulated cyclone energy for the first three weeks of August for 2018 have lodged a new record. So we, we, we have just experienced a new record high ACE or accumulated cyclone energy for for the period of August 20, August 1st through August 21st of this year. Now, this new record measure comes in in combination with some very warm sea surface temperatures in the northeastern Pacific. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I'd just like to note which storms have occurred in early to mid-August providing this new record. It's worth noting that Hector was a strong was a category four storm that formed during very late July and, and continued to run through the middle of August. Alina, tropical storm Alina Hurricane John, Tropical Storm Christy, and of course, Hurricane Lane. So five storms occurring in this period, two of which were major hurricanes, Category 4, approaching the, the top intensity of hurricanes. And this satellite shot from August 7th provides just an idea of the frequency of storms during this period, showing three tropical cyclones active all at the same time in the Northeast Pacific. Now looking at some of the climatological conditions that are helping to contribute to storm formation, one of the things we talk a lot about here is uh, sea surface temperature, which is it provides basic fuel for hurricanes. And the warmer the sea surface temperature, the warm the, the higher the, the peak potential intensity of storms. Now the atmosphere also needs to come into play to provide support for storms. But if you have a base of warmer than normal sea surface temperatures, then, then you've, you've set the stage for the potential for very strong storms. 
Now, with human-caused climate change, sea surface temperatures are warming around the globe and helping to fuel the peak potential intensity of storms and, and to move the peak potential intensity of storms higher when they do form doesn't necessarily mean that storms will be more frequent, but what it does do is it moves the bar when it comes to the potential top intensity of storms. Now for this year, the, the Pacific is transitioning into an El Nino state, which tends to warm the equatorial Pacific. And presently, the central Pacific is experiencing a, a good deal of warming as the Pacific appears to be on a trend toward an El Nino state. But it's worth noting that, that what we see in particular is that sea surfaces out of the equatorial zone beyond the 20 degree north latitude line are also much warmer than normal east of the 180 degree longitude line. And this is also contributing to to hurricane strength by generating more moisture, more water vapor in the atmosphere for storms to feed on through evaporation, and kicking the heat engine effect into a bit of a higher gear. Now, in addition to El Nino, which is a, a cyclical aspect of the Pacific climate, which can tend to increase the prevalence of strong hurricanes. This year, we have also seen a persistent ridge pattern over the Northeast Pacific and in particular close to the U.S. West Coast and the Canadian West Coast and the coast of Alaska. And this persistent ridge has fed into heat wave patterns, uh, strong drying patterns for the most part, strong powerful wildfires that have been occurring over this region and aiding in the high sea surface temperatures that we have seen recently. Now, there's a bit of a handshake between sea ice loss and movement of the jet stream in this zone. A number of scientific studies have indicated that sea ice loss in the Arctic does tend to help gen generate a prevalence for jet stream ridges over the Northeast Pacific and the U.S. West. And in addition, well, actually, before I go into an analysis or a deeper analysis with regards to that, I'd just like to note that by, by the volume measure, we have lost approximately 50% of sea ice volume versus the mean from 1979 to the present year and considerably more sea ice volume since the 1980s, where, where we've lost, if you average the recent years, probably about 60% of sea ice volume. So, so sea ice has been cut in half or more from the volume measure standpoint since the 1980s. And, and this does have an effect on regional and global climate signals. It's worth noting that one recent paper which modeled the effect of a seasonal sea ice loss, which would be a complete loss of sea ice during the summer, on the Pacific Ocean found that it generated a warming signal throughout the Pacific. Now, we haven't had a complete loss of sea ice yet seasonally, but the Arctic is trending in that direction, and it's likely that the Pacific Ocean is... is already feeling some of the effects of sea ice loss. But what I'd like to call your attention to is that the, the telegraph, the, 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 the change that occurs according to this model study in American geophysical research letter, letters entitled Fast Response of the Tropics to, a, to an Abrupt Loss of Arctic Sea Ice via Ocean Dynamics shows that the, the change in Pacific temperatures occurs rather rapidly once sea ice is lost. And so like on a six to 25 year time scale, you see a, a bit, a considerable bit of, of change in temperatures in the Pacific region in one set of models, the, the FOM models. And the SOM models show a, a, an even more considerable increase in sea surface temperatures 
over a, over a very brief interval of a six to 25 year time frame. So it doesn't take long for the Pacific Ocean to respond to sea ice loss and show a warming signature